Welcome to the recorded version of the History Council of New South Wales Writing Histories panel, recorded via Zoom on the 9th of November 2023. History isn't just about dusty old books and dates, it's about sharing the tales of our past with the world. But how do historians make sure their stories reach a wide audience? How do we pen our words for different readers? The History Council of New South Wales called on some of the brightest minds in history to share about how they've shared their research with a variety of audiences, inspired by their recently published books. Our panel will chat about both classic and cutting-edge ways to spread the word about historical events, people and themes, while also dishing out advice for other writers who want to carve their own paths. We hope you enjoy. Thank you everyone for being here today and welcome. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded lands of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people, wherever we are, and um, acknowledge Elders past, present and future. Um, and I invite you all to also acknowledge country from wherever you are um, in the chat. So welcome to today's um, Writing History session, which is the, will be the last in our careers and history panel for 2023. Um, so just in terms of the format, um, uh, it was going to be some time in the beginning for Kate and Kira to speak about their work and a little bit in conversation with me. And then after about 20 or so minutes, we will open it up to questions uh, from, from, from people who are listening. Thank you and wel uh, welcome. Um, so questions um, will go into the chat, I think, and then I think there is some other, there is some kind of Slido thing that Amanda's organised for us to, to to filter kind of questions, the, the most popular questions to the top. Okay, so let me introduce, first of all, my, who am I? Um, my name is Lee Luigi Vigier. I'm from the Torres Strait. Um, I'm a historian and I work with predominantly with um, 19th century museum collections from the Torres Strait to think about the kinds of histories we might write if we start with objects. So a little bit, maybe a little bit kind of like object biographies, but not, um, which kind of brings me now to our um, our illustrious guests. I'm so excited that Kira and and Kate are here to do uh, to be part of this. So first of, first of all, introducing um, Dr. Kira Lindsay. Um, Kira is an award-winning creative historian uh, who specializes in developing imaginative but ethical ways of representing those who might otherwise remain shadowy or even silent in the historical record. Kira's most recent book, Wild Love, published um, just this month. No, I lie, in October published in no. October <laughs> yeah released yeah. formally on the 31st of October <laughs> aha right so that so yes but certainly Kate's was published in October um so Kira's most recent book while love is her second work in the emerging subgenre of life writing known as speculative biography it's described as a bold work of imagination wild love reconstructs the passionate life of Adelaide Ironside who was the granddaughter of a convict forger and the first locally born professional female professional painter to lead the country to study abroad. Thank you for being here tonight, Kira. Um, yes. And Professor Kate Fuller is our other guest today. Kate is a prominent Australian historian who specialises in the history of the 18th century world, particularly the British Empire and the many Indigenous societies it encountered in diverse global contexts. Um, what we'll hear more about tonight, although Kate kind of intimated she's a bit tired of talking about her book. I, I, <laughs> I wonder about that, though, Kate. Um, but what we're going to hear more about is Benelong and Philip, A History Unraveled. Um, it's been described as daring and imaginative and that it challenges the way we think about the past. And, and Kate, I just want to say I was quite taken by the cover and the positioning of Philip and Benelong in that way, because it kind of, for me, it was so striking because I thought, yeah, this is going to be a different kind of history. So I was quite excited about that. So, and the other thing is, Kate, you talk about this also as a joint biography that tells the stories of Benelong and Philip backwards. So, um, okay, so first of all, what I think I've got here, what an impressive pairing of authors. 
tonight, imaginative, bold, and daring new books. And I thought then, Kate, we might start with you. Um, unlike Adelaide Ironside, many of us know Benelong and Philip. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us how you decided to write their biographies backwards and what this was like for you to do. And the other thing I've been thinking about is how the, your book, and for both of you really, how your latest book reflects your kind of deliberate or accidental trajectories as historians. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Leah. Um, that's wonderful to be here. So yes, as you intimated, unlike um, Ironside, uh, my two subjects are reasonably well known in Australia, certainly in Sydney. Um, and I kind of actually was, I was interested in playing on the so-called well-knownness of both of them in many ways, um, particularly in Sydney, you can't avoid those two names being attached to so many places. And I'm here in Canberra today, actually, and there's a Phillip suburb and there's Phillip pool and there's Phillip whatnot. There's not so much, but actually within Phillip suburb, there's Colby court and things like that, which is associated with Philip, but there's no Benelong. But of course, there's Benelong all over Sydney. So in some ways, I was attracted to um, the idea of <clears throat> two men who are supposedly well known, but actually, you only have to scrape the surface. And both of them, in some ways, have been overdetermined by their well known names. Um, and their, their current, the, the current state of their biography in Australian kind of popular memory is a bit thin. And really, I, I would say in both cases, something that deserved not, not so much deepening, but even just straight out overturning or even reversing, which I guess tie, it prompted me to start thinking about reversal, your second kind of question about why did I write it backwards? So, um, so yes, unlike, you know, uncovering someone usually lost to history, I wanted to, to you know, what I would argue, recover the, the lost other histories that one, one one might write about two supposedly famous men or two who's two men whose names are so overdetermined in this country. Um, and the way that I I, I was I, I've been thinking about writing it in reverse, not because I advocate reverse histories per se. Um, it turned out to be it, it was fun to write, but it turned out to be kind of a hard book to edit and also to like persuade my publishers to give it a go as well. Um, but uh, but I, I was thinking that it was the appropriate method method for this particular subject um, and that yeah again again as I said was prompted by me thinking that I wanted to reverse the images that we have of them and just in a nutshell I would say that the kind of popular common image of Philip we have is of a founding father of our settler nation and all the best things that we that we Australians want to associate with that settler nation in an aspirational sense so we, we do often find Philip's name attached to the word enlightenment and all the kind of um, more positive aspects that we might think about that word. Uh, but really, I wanted to show, kind of up, upturn that image quite a bit and show that Philip would have would have hated the idea that he was a founding father of a separate nation because he was a very loyal servant of a huge and escalating empire, global empire. And the idea of, you know, birthing a nation that would separate from the empire would have been horrifying to him. So I really wanted to ground him in the imperial context that I, that I found him in and, 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 and the kind of context that any 18th century historian would have found him in. And for Benelong, I was even more keen to reverse his common image, which has you know, changed over the years. And I think a lot of people do recognise him as a valuable negotiator for a few years with the early colony. But so often the, the way that we remember him is as a tragic figure who sort of dies lost between two worlds. And my research really showed that that was not at all the case. Um, so beginning with the end, beginning with Philip ensconced back in his British empire and beginning with Benelong ensconced in his, back in his community, beloved, esteemed um, and respected was a quick and easy way to start that kind of unraveling process. Yeah. I, maybe I'll jump to the um, accidental thing after Kira's had, a, had her explanation. Yes, great. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, so Kira, um, so so Kira, um, let me see. So for you, speculative biographies. Why write speculative biographies, and why of this? Why of Adelaide Ironside? And I'm just thinking, um, Kira, what is neat? What was neat? Was there something writing a spe speculative biography? Something that you needed to do? That that was the only way that you think. Maybe not the only way, but that was the better way to tell this story. And I was wondering 
would someone else perhaps write a speculative biography because of a scarcity of primary sources like I'm just thinking of I was thinking in mm, okay yeah that those kinds of questions thanks yeah sure so look I, I'd start by just saying that my biography is also a relational biography so it tells the story of both Adelaide Ironside and her mother so um it's it's a relational biography it's a mother-daughter biography um, the mother appears less frequently but because she is um, a primary part of the story she's featured in the archives etc cetera, etc cetera, that it would have been remiss not to include that so that's another interesting kind of parallel there was actually a biography previously has been previous work done on Adelaide Ironside so although she is little known she's not entirely unknown so in 1987 uh, a woman named Jill Poulton produced a very good art focused biography biography of Poulton called The Pilgrim of Art and um, and and Ros Pesman from Sydney University has also done a little work constituating Adelaide within her writerly context her context of that kind of moment in the Victorian era to which she became part when she left Sydney in uh, 1855 to uh, travel overseas with Rome in her heart she said so that she could become a sister painter on her own terms live a life of aspiration and return to Sydney to become the acknowledged mistress of art in the Southern Hemisphere. So th those were her ambitions. And, um, and so there have been other works done by her. But in fact, Leah, when one of the things that drew me to writing about Adelaide Ironside after my first book, The Convict's Daughter, which was about my great, great, great art, was that um, whilst both women are Australian-born Europeans, um, both born in Sydney within six months of each other in the early 1830s and within a couple of streets of each other as well, so they provide a window into a neglected demographic within early European society in Sydney, but they live very, very different lives. Um, but whereas Mary Ann Gill, my first, of my my um, ancestor, had very scanty sources, she appears only for a moment of time because she was involved in a romantic scandal which um, found its way into the courts and the newspapers. And therefore, I have a deposition um, relating to the moment where she stood too agitated to speak in the in the colonial courts. In contrast to that, and a tear stained signature in a deposition, Adelaide's Ironside seemingly looks like an abundance of riches so this is not so much about just scanty sources as it might be about porous and problematic sources and and to be frank I think almost every historical record that we look at is problematic in any way in in all ways because it's got partialities and biases that are immediately obvious obvious or more subtle um so I was really thinking about I guess one of the things that I've come out with is a couple of big questions for myself that have been driving my work and my first work um, was described as a speculative biography so I took that concept up and made that the source the the subject of an ARC um, dis discovery, what they call a DECRA award, and that was historical craft, speculative biography and the case of Adelaide Ironside. And what I was trying to do was answer a couple of questions. One, can the ends justify the means? So um, if, when we're trying to recover these kind of people with difficult sources, when we're working with them, can we use informed imagination? If so, how do we inform our imagination? And my findings are really around the fact that I think we need to use the discipline of context. We need to be exhaustive in our research, but not exhausting in the way we communicate that in narrative form. Um, but I think that, you know, if we want to get at something richer, in the way that we understand the past, sometimes we need to combine historical truths and literary truths. And so one of my things has been to push back against that famous statement that Inga Clendenin made in 2006 in her quarterly essay, Who Owns the Past, where she said, history and fiction must remain on either side of the ravine, never to meet. I think of the, these two as different ways of accessing the past that are like streams that can float into a, an estuary that actually make our capacity to understand the past richer because we can access subjective truths through our imagination as well as through um, an engagement with fact. So I'm talking about methodological innovation and I don't think that's accidental. I think I'm quite deliberate about it. But along the way, there are many, many moments of synchronicity. <laughs> Fantastic. That is so exciting. Um, and it's reminding me of um, something that Martin Nakata wrote 
when he was working with working with the collection uh, on the work that was done by Haddon and Cambridge Collection um, from the late 19th century. And he talked about l l responding, looking at the archive, looking at all that material and not looking at it in a way that is not ignorant, uh, ignorant of um, Torres Strait Islander knowledges, um, but also positioning himself clearly within yeah, thinking about that. So which I see, you know, which comes through strongly in your talking about, you know, your your initial work. Um, fantastic. So so um, I guess now then thinking about my other question around how you get to uh, where you are in terms of, you know, is it is it is it? So, yeah. So what is it that gets you? Is it is it deliberate? Uh, do you plot the way and you know exactly what you're going to be doing when? And where, or is it a, is it more a stumbling upon, and then finding different ways to to take your uh, your historical writing? Um, I can answer that. Sorry, I'm just experimenting with having one ear and one ear out because <laughs> having strange audio. Uh, hopefully, that sounds the same quality. That is fine. Before. Yeah, that's okay, fine. Good, Thanks. Good. I couldn't hear myself before, so I'm sort of talking into the empty brain. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. So, accidental or deliberate? Well. Um, and I, quite a lot of my colleagues do kind of accidentally stumble on, you know, the perfect archive that leads them to the perfect project. That's never actually happened to me, I have to say. Um, in this case, for this particular book, um, I mean, my previous books had been kind of deliberately worked out to kind of fill a niche that I thought was problematic, I suppose. But in this particular book, interestingly, I really felt, I, I had thought about doing this book for more than a decade, um, yeah, 12, 14 years maybe, but I didn't didn't ever think that I was going to actually go ahead with it because I actually didn't think of myself as an Australian historian, uh, just a historian who happens to be Australian. I, as you know, Elia, I'm mostly interested in 18th century European and Pacific um, kind of encounter histories. Um, but I had written one small piece on Benelong many years ago out of my PhD thesis, um, which was just called Benelong in Britain, which just covered the two years that he had in Britain. And that happened to be open access, that article. And I have to say that I have had more inquiries from journalists and members of the public about that one little article, of which I don't even feel up, thought of myself as an expert on, than all of my other work put together. Constantly I had journalists and then increasingly Indigenous people asking me for more information about, about Ben Long. And so in that sense, I was prompted to think this is actually... Um, that, that, that there is a gap that, that that felt more urgent than any other any of the other gaps that I kind of had identified as an academic that I thought that I was filling, because I wanted to be able. To, I, I, was, I just thought that there there is a public thirst for more information about this this man who has a name that's so common and yet an image that has changed a lot over the years and people still felt unsure about. So I was prompted to do that, and then as you mentioned in your the, the question of positionality. I also felt that my positionality didn't really suggest that I should probably write a book only about yeah. Benelong and also my training is in 18th century. Anyway, we're more. more. Um, so, and I hit upon the idea of a joint biography and I have done comparative biographies before in the past and I found it a very quick and easy way to bring out key themes, um, which you might otherwise kind of take a while to get to. So when I can say, for instance, want to talk about the gender relations of both worlds, uh, of both men's worlds, it was easy to say, if I'm depicting Philip's world and his kind of marriages and his relationship with gender, it was very quick to then um, do a, a sidestep into the gendered world of Benelong. It's kind of, you set the reader up to kind of think about these comparative themes. Once you've raised a theme for one man, you can easily raise the theme for another man. So um, I, I found a lot, I, I really like the like doing comparative work in a whole bunch of subjects, but particularly comparative biography. So yeah, the, 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 the shorter answer to why I wrote this particular book was to really answer a call for more work on Benelong or clarity about Benelong. And then I actually really was convinced by my own kind of initial dubious idea, but then I became convinced that there was probably a call for rethinking some of our founding fathers as well. There's been some quite a lot of work on Captain Cook. He's endlessly controversial. Philip has done well out of the controversy of Cook, I must say, because then he manages to fly under the radar. But he, he does seem to be this kind of, oh, well, he's an Enlightenment guy. He was probably kind of nice, you know, too bad all the other governors were a bit shit. Actually, you know, he may well have been an Enlightenment man, but I wanted to show through him that Enlightenment is not the cosy liberal um, position that <laughs> we might want to 
thought that it became in the 19th century. In the 18th century, it had plenty of room for uh, massacres and violence. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so he was a good conduit for that. Of course. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, Kira. Mm. That that question opens up a lot of good stuff for me, Leah, if I can run with that one. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, I spend a lot of time... I spent seven years kind of researching writing this book and uh, and in the process um, I, um, you know, I went back to those sources again and again and again and again until I felt that I was in a kind of deep attunement with them and, uh, and yet they continue to frustrate me. So, for example, in the State Library of New South Wales where a lot of the archives related to the Ironsides are held. They're called correspondence mainly received because most of them are letters to the Ironsides from um, quite eminent Victorians like uh, Sir James Clark, who was Queen Victoria's preferred doctor and well known for his um, dubious treatment of uh, the poet John Keats in, in Italy before he died. And, uh, and also treated Adelaide for tuberculosis. But the more I returned to those archives, the more questions I had, the more opaque and frustrating they felt for me. And, uh, and so I had this kind of methodological idea that by attuning to the sources, the subject, the story itself would come out, but um, it didn't work. So I wrote a first draft that was around 120,000 words, sent it off to the um, publisher. Um, I, I was already under contract and they sent it back pretty swiftly within a couple of months and just said it's just not working you need to start again and so when I started again I looked beyond the archive to elements of Adelaide's own life and a couple of things struck me first was things that were absent so one of her most famous paintings called the Pilgrim of Art which she painted um, to honour the journey that she and her mother took abroad has, uh, was returned to Sydney after she died, but it was left to deteriorate in a three-sided shed. And so that painting is gone. So I started to conceptualise my work as a representing of that lost painting. Likewise, she painted over 40 Australian wildflowers, which um, made her so famous that when she was overseas, she frequently described herself as the flower of Australia to people. So she was kind of trading in on um, the exotification of those flowers to position herself and because all those flowers are also lost, those flowers and representing those flowers, I was kind of sewing them back into the story also as a way of trying to bring First Nation presence back into the book because the archive was deafeningly silent in, in that regards. Um, but I remember sitting in the State Library one afternoon and just feeling so flummoxed by these letters that were cross-hatched, had no signatures, had no dates, and um, I started to think that it was as opaque, the archive itself was as opaque as the crystal ball into which um, Adelaide Ironside had once scried for Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the most famous poet of the 19th century. And, uh, and so I started to read about the act of scrying as reading crystal balls was known at the time. And it turns out that the process is very like reading an archive for meaning, that what you're meant to do is still your mind and allow a sort of rapt attention to settle over the archive and in the process of stilling your mind and allowing soft suggestions and possibilities to appear it was like suddenly parts of the archive those snatch sentences those um, moments of conversation that really didn't make much meaning started to um, almost emerge from the opaqueness of the archive and that was how I realised I needed to tell the story. The other formative part of it was that I realised that um, Adelaide Ironside was a contemporary of Jane Eyre. Uh, Jane Eyre was published in 1847 at this very time that Adelaide was making her way as a young portraitist and both of them painted in the ideal. Both of them are described as being very fey and fascinated with the IC, you know, being descended from oh, the green people. Yeah. And so there's all these little things about being plain, ordinary, poor that shape both of their lives. So these sort of things became... Um, elements that really shaped the way that I was conceptualising that biography. Mm -hmm. So a series of accidents and meditations, I think. That's fantastic. Because it and it's and I'm thinking now as well, connecting that to something that I read that you said, Kate, 
about um, about thinking about country and connection to place. So, so, you, so here, Kira raises the presence that kind of um, finding and reinserting the Aboriginal presence, the Indigenous presence. And you, you've talked about thinking about country and writing from country. Um, and I wonder if you could say some more about that, because for me, for me, I spent time on Murray Island to write about Murray Island, and I felt like I needed to do that. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, well, as I said, I've been thinking about Ben Long for a very long time, not realising that I would actually write a whole book about him, but I've been thinking about him. And I first started thinking about him when I was at Macquarie University, which is on Wallamadigal land, which is where Ben Long spent the last 17 years of his life. And actually, it's those 17 years of his life that actually is the underknown part of which I, of course, begin the book because it's a book that goes backwards. Yeah. And they're the most important 17 years, for my argument anyway, because they're 17 years that are often written off in Australian history textbooks as that's when he became a drunken, hopeless kind of mm -hmm. symbol of, um, of lack of an Aboriginal future, which mm -hmm. he has in various left and or right wing guises in mm -hmm. ever since. Um, but actually, the research shows that he was well ensconced back in a beloved, uh, a, you know, a loving uh, mixed clan society. Um, he probably, I speculate, um, uh, uh, retained the title of kind of healer uh, there, but it certainly became a kind of a leader or, 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 or elder. There is, the word elder is not used in the sources that I could find, but um, from what I would gather, I think he'd be elder. So being on Wallamadigal land was very poignant for me. Um, some some listeners today here may know that um, on Wallamadigal land a few years ago, the New South Wales state government purchased a plot of land on the basis of their belief that it contains the body of Benelong. Um, that plot is still not kind of doing much. It is in the ownership mm. of the government, but it's still there to see what might become of it. Um, it was <clears throat> it was very easy for me to make a quick little pilgrimage there and to kind of sense sense his presence there. But, um, of course, he was not a Wallamadigal person from uh, birth. He was born on Wongal land, which is south of the river, um, which is where I sort of was living when I was working at Macquarie. So it, it was it, it, it was very important to me to think mm. about those places. Um, and ob obviously, most of the insiders recognise the importance of Gadigal land, um, where the State Library is and, and the CBD is, um, which is also where Ben Long spent a lot of time. That, that was the chief place where he was um, interacting with Philip and appreciating through my research how much Bellong was conscious of himself as being a stranger in Gadigal land as well or being a guest in Gadigal, Gadigal land really kind of underscored the, the sense of everyone was a guest on someone else's land only some of them knew it at the time or some of them um, recognized some of the protocols about being a guest at the time so that was very important to me but I must say that I wrote most of it well away from the Sydney region, um, which I guess in some ways um, helped me to do some of the reflective, maybe what Kira would call the meditative work, um, yeah. to have a little bit of distance on that as well. But but I think beginning the project in Benelong's clan or clan associated lands was very important for me to have a to, to begin thinking from the get go about how much Benelong. Uh, recognized his country and the surrounding countries as very much part of his identity and try and and seeing him actually trying to communicate that to Philip and Philip getting scarics of it here and there but not mm. fully understanding the the full philosophy of that yeah terrific thank you that's just fascinating mm -hmm. um I have one more question before we go I think to wet questions from people in the audience um and it's about where you think, where you both think your approaches in these books take the writing of Australian history. Um, is it? Is it? So I, I don't know. Is there a turn? Is there a? a, a can we use? A, I don't. I don't even know. A biographical turn. Maybe that's happened before. But is there a new turn on its way? I wondered if you could respond to that. Thanks. Yeah, did you want to jump in first? Well, I think uh, I'm going to hand that one over to you to start off with, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, there are always plenty of biographies um, in Australian bookshops, uh, bookshelves, but not always written by historians, though. So mm. I enjoy the uh, the biographies that are written from a more historical bent because I think that, I mean, I always think of myself as a historian first, even though I had the last couple of books I've written definitely have a biographical method, but I always, always identify as a historian, not a biographer necessarily. 
the story in the user's biography. So I'm always interested in telling the story of lives in order to illuminate a, a larger past. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case mm -hmm. of Belong and Philip, that larger past, which is, you know, well, we, we might begin that, we, we might begin at a book thinking, uh, pick up a book called Better Long and Philip, thinking, oh, this is going to be about the early years of the colony, uh, which is sort of my hook, I suppose, into making people buy it. The, the larger argument is that we actually need to understand a whole larger 18th century um, and not focus so much on the 1788 years um, to really get, get a grasp of what the meaning of those men interacting in those early years really meant. Um, but either way, the, the point of those those biographies in my case and the and the entanglement, show, showing them being entangled, was to illuminate two whole worlds coming together. And the significance of that, it, it, it was quite easy to make the case for this book, the significance of that still today. It came out, my book came out 10 days before the referendum. I worked super hard in those particular 10 days to try and say, this is the story that should be shadowing you when you go into the ballot box. Mm -hmm. This is not just a story of the last 10 years and not even a story of the last 50 years. This is the story of basically failed conciliation, uh, which yeah. what we should be taking into the ballot box. And I think, yeah. you know, quite mm. a few people were thinking of 230 years of um, encounter when they went in, but obviously not quite sufficient numbers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes, I did. Mm. I did get that. <laughs> Sledgehammer view at the last few pages of the book. Anyway. <laughs> yes, Kira. Well, <clears throat> um, in uh, the introduction, we um, didn't quite acknowledge or mention that I'm also the history advocate in South Australia. So in my role, I work for the History Trust of South Australia, which is a um, uh, part of the state government. And my role is to champion all forms of history. Um, so history that is done within the academy, that is done by enthusiasts as well as experts um, and entrepreneurs, and um, and to kind of see a thousand flowers fl grow, I guess. And in the course of my DECRA, I really found myself troubling history. And there was a time there where I wanted to step back from the, the H word altogether. So um, <laughs> and I was more comfortable with the word biography because it gave me more latitude and it also allowed me to tap into a very old tradition. So, for example, in my book, um, Adelaide Ironside becomes quite friendly with a woman named Virginia Summers. Now, Virginia Summers is the grand aunt of Virginia Woolf and Virginia Woolf wrote a speculative biography, we might call it, on um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning through the perspective of Browning's dog called Flush. So there is this very old tradition going back to, you know, the uh, early part of the 20th century of people using innovative biographical forms to get at something truthful about the past. And I found and myself I just, in that I space. Just, um, jump in, Kira, and say, spoken like a true historian to give us that background. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've come back around to history, you know, of course, in my role. Um, but I think it's been really healthy to trouble it. Um, and I think, you know, a real love of history and historical method means that perhaps the buck doesn't just stop with history, right? Sometimes I think it's really important to say that we can use our historical methods, skills and consciousness for a range of things that may or may not be called history. So if, Leah, to come to your question is will this work is it contributing to a turn or anything you know I kind of would like to um, hopefully open up a provocation to people to continue to feel that it's really healthy to trouble history and Kurtois and John Docker they talked about history's need to be endlessly reinventive they said it's doubleness comes from art and science science is all about speculation art is all about narrative sometimes I think historians Australian historians in the last 20 years or so we were so mortified by the history wars that we kind of retreated into empiricism and the kind of lively experimentation that was part of my training as a historian, um, part of the way that I grew up in, in those kind of mm -hmm. environments has receded a little bit. And I guess I, you know, a little bit like Adelaide Ironside, who definitely liked to make calls to arms, who was bold and imaginative, I too feel like there's nothing wrong with troubling history and putting out the invitation there that we can use historical methods, skills and consciousness to push to push the boundaries of what history is because the more capacious it is the broader of the church 
the more people are enlivened by the possibilities and what the past means to us in the in the now. I just want to say one final thing, which is I heard this wonderful quote today, which is, you know, obviously the past is never dead. We roll it up like a carpet and carry it with us wherever we go. And um, and yet when we unroll that carpet, it's a fresh moment. And uh, and I think our books are like these little fresh moments where we unroll the carpet and invite people in. <laughs> Fantastic. That I, I can't think of a better place to throw this open to um uh to listeners, to the audience for their questions, because I think that's the yeah, um that's a provocation has come out. Um <laughs> and Amanda or Catherine, how are we going with where are the questions at? Because I have questions myself. <laughs> Why don't you start, Leah? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to start? Okay. Um, um, okay, no, where am I, where am I up to? I'm looking at my notes. So, so one of the things I've got here is, um, again, staying with biographies. So I've been, you know, my work, uh, on turtle shell masks was working with, um, working with objects to write deeper histories of both of place, but also of people in place. Um, so, and I think, um, and Grace Kaskins talks about, writes about ghost histories. Yeah. So one of the things, one of the questions I have here is um, in thinking about, you know, coming at the histories from these different angles, do we, it, is there a need to balance is there a need for balance in the in sort of the rigor of history writing, or is it so? I'm so I'm hearing, but you know, I'm thinking Kira's provocation is saying no way. Every we, we should be able to use what is available to us to write to write the histories we need. So I wonder. Oh yeah, that. but I would say to that, I think we need to be very um, reflective about what is available to us. So I think often we. Um, rehearse and repeat the same well-traveled sources and we don't think laterally about other sources obviously when we do object biographies there's a great opportunity to kind of come in through the back door of history I think as um, Delia Falconer said um, and that can be very very rich but I just think you know one of these claims that I've made myself over the years is oh well there's not much you know there's very Typically, you know, I justify the speculative, my speculative methods by saying sources get produced by people who had the economics education and influence to leave sources or to be deemed valid enough to leave sources. But um, I'm starting to get annoyed with that because I think, in fact, we just don't. One of the things I'd like to see us do, and I think I think we do do this, it's become so hyper sensitive to the world around us that we see everything as a potential source. Yeah. Terrific. What do you think? What thoughts, Kate? Um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, that's, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the, the question of sort of scarcity and do we have enough and do, do we retread them? There were in some interesting moments, which I try and highlight in my book that, um, having these two parallel lives there is on occasion um more sources for a given moment on Benelong than there is on Philip mm -hmm. um which goes against the kind of assumptions I think that anyway my normal kind of my, my everyday historian colleagues assumed that um that you know of course we, we couldn't really do a full proper biography of someone like Ben Long because of course the sources would would, would, be, would be inadequate and of course we could endlessly do um, sources on someone like Arthur Phillip because he's a great white man and they always leave enough sources um, th there are plenty of there are plenty of moments in my narrative particularly uh, in the couple of years that they both men are together in London where there's many more there's much more evidence to show what Ben Long is doing mm. day by day almost um, than we know about uh, Philip and even when Philip does leave sources of his own they're often very tedious sort of descriptions into his diary as I'm, I'm sure some historians listening here today have, have uh, read some of those first fleet journals I mean they're not most scintillating stuff to read um, but very well worn um, 
And of course, people weren't observing Philip quite as much as they were observing someone like Ben Long. So we have much more sort of secondhand understandings of Ben Long, which are always, of course, a bit compromised, but 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 they do exist. So um, yeah, this is not necessary. And actually, I did try and mobilize some object uh, objects as evidence mm. um, when I'm thinking about mm. um, Ben Long. I mean, I was obviously thinking about you know when I'm thinking about the the imagery that was taken of both men. Um, and then their, therefore their relationship to art and with the graphic culture of both their men's lives, it naturally leads me to thinking about Ben Long's relationship to the, mm. to the art that would be ground into the you know, stone around him. So I did try and sort of think a bit laterally about that. But it, uh, it, it was a, it, it's an object lesson, if I can pun it that way, <laughs> that, um, that particularly in the 18th century, when there's such a strong assumption that you couldn't possibly write the full biography of an Indigenous person, my previous book had two biographies of an Indigenous person compared compared to another great white man called Joshua Reynolds. And again, there were moments that I found again that sometimes the two Indigenous people leave more sources, leave more legacies, if you can think laterally about them, than someone who's supposedly so famous that their biography is, you know, taken for granted. Yeah, so... Mm. Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Kira was saying in terms of uh, we, we, we do need to constantly think laterally about what counts as evidence. Okay. Great. I, yeah. All right. I'm sorry. I was thinking about something um, that I came across towards the very end of my of my my um, dissertation writing, and I did it didn't end up in the dissertation, but it did end up in the book, which was a which was a, a finding in the archive that. Um, that uh, so it's kind of it's related to a mask that was taken from one of the central islands. So just thinking about connecting, connecting, I suppose, islander um, ideas about what happens when things are stolen to what happens in the end, you know, what is visited upon the person who steals the thing. Mm. So um, so you may have heard um, an expression that was used quite a lot during the Mabo, uh, Mabo and others case, tag uh, in Murray Island, lang Miriamir, tag maki maki, teter maki maki. So, um, so tag his hand and basically says your hand, the hand should not touch what it, what does not belong to it. And the feet should not walk on country that is not its land. Yeah. So this is about a mask that was taken um, that was stolen by Charles Lewis in like in the 1830s and it ended up in the museum, uh, in the Australian Museum. Um, so um, I, I came across, um, and I came across this kind of, this plea from Lewis's wife a few years after that had happened, a plea to the governor, to Governor Burke, I think, so writing to the governor saying, um, I need um, I need support from the governor uh, because his uh, the governor's servant, um, my husband, Charles Lewis, has... Um, has taken, uh, I can't remember the term of the phrase now, but basically said he's gone mad and he's left and he's left the colony and returned to um, to England without telling me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, I remember reading that thinking and thinking, oh my God, Islanders say, tag maki maki, teter maki maki. So if you take things that don't belong to you, stuff happens. Yeah. Stuff mm -hmm. will happen. So it's mm -hmm. those, and I, you know, when I was thinking about that, you know, those kinds of things that we stumble upon that change a story mm. um, that change the way you might write about something I was quite yeah I was quite excited uh, um, and I do spend my time kind of you know I suppose in the archives looking for those moments again yeah um, so I've got some yeah mm. Did you... well, I just wanted to make a, a quick argument for um, really spending a lot of time with contemporary historical scholarship because um, I just give you a quick example of how useful I found it, as well as reading through the works of Stephen Gaps on um, on elements to do with frontier war throughout the Sydney region, and Paul Irish's book um, Hidden in Plain View to um, you know do my own work on representing um, First Nation presence throughout the book, and um, and also Walking Country with Auntie Fran Bodkin and drawing on her stories of the wildflowers to weave, weave those through the book. Um, the other thing that really struck me was that because Adelaide was a spiritualist and she described herself as having an enthusiasm for the invisible, but this had been really quite kind of dismissed and um, not given much attention by previous scholars because of their kind of 
allergy, I think, for engaging with people's beliefs um, and especially the spiritualist beliefs, which have kind of we've inherited in these um, cartoonesque forms of wrapping tables and tw turning, twisting tables and um, things like that. But when you go into uh, the scholarship of the last 15 years or so, Victorianists are now making the argument, quite rightly, I think, that if you want to understand the 19th century, there are four elements, abolitionists, abolitionism, the woman's question, um, industrialism and spiritualism, that it is one of the most important things, particularly for uh, lower to middle class women like Adelaide Ironside, because it gave them spiritual and moral authority, as well as a place to assume a voice, a performative voice in the world. Uh, so mm. I think this is really mm. significant and it completely shaped the way that I went about my book. And to go right back to the question that you asked early on about why speculation, Leo, and Another thing that came out when I started to uh, think about this crystal ball kind of metaphor was that the word speculation itself comes from the word speculari, which comes from um, the idea of the magic mirror, to peer into the magic mirror and find meaning and, and imaginative insight from that one. So it kind of was all moving around that you've got to, I think, where historical fiction is at its best and where it sometimes lets the team down in terms of a rich engagement with the past is that, um, that contemporary historical scholarship that can just bring things to life in a way that resonate for now because it's written for now. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kira. Was there so anything that you wanted to add, um, Kate? No, no, no. So I go, no that's, yeah. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, the, so one of the questions that's come from someone in the audience, um, uh, uh, and I'll just read it out from Michael, um, asking how do we integrate the interaction of early colonists with, um, with Aboriginal people into stories of colonial ancestors when you can't find accounts of any interactions? Well, I found plenty in mine. So this is probably more of a question for Kira because she <laughs> already mentioned that she kind of went searching uh, to fill in some of the silences in her story. So Kira, do you want to address that? Yeah. Okay. So one example of this, Michael, is uh, that the story that I write starts down the bottom of, of the lower end of George Street in Sydney uh, at a place called Redmond Court, which is where Adelaide's grandfather um, lived. He um, His name was John Redmond. He was the first fleet marine, but the town jailer and the jail was across the road. And his house was um, just across the road from the jail. And we know from family oral memories, um, because Redmond Court stayed there, it wasn't um, it wasn't knocked down into the early 20th century, that he had been in Norfolk Island and he'd come back and he had planted two Norfolk pines at Redmond Court. So I knew where Adelaide grew up and I knew that there were these trees in the background. And then I happened to find a painting, look again at a painting, uh, a sketch, in fact, by Augustus Earle. It's quite a famous sketch. It's called um, New South Wales Natives um, in Sydney. And it's it's probably a, a picture of um, um, Queen Cora Gooseberry and her family uh, down the lower end of George Street. And we know it's George Street because on the side of the hotel in this picture, it has... George Street, and you can see the two Norfolk pines right. in the background. So we know that this is a place where Adelaide and Martha frequented a lot. And so just this image provided me with a way of uh, looking into their family and to realising that they would have had pretty much, you know, regular engagement with um, with those very well-known Sydney First Nations personalities and people and families. So I think, again, what we've got to be doing is turning mm. over every stone and thinking, where can I look for this? Is it in artwork? Is it in secondary scholarship like Paul Irish? Is it in um, is it in family records? Is it in stories um, by people like Auntie Fran Bodkin? I think we've got to develop relationships. We've got to keep asking questions. 
Um, but I also think that there's another big challenge in there, which is how do you live within the hermetically sealed world um, of those early colonists when you're writing um, in through their perceptions. So that can be really quite challenging because their language is obviously often pretty offensive to, to now. So I would say never accept the silences, <laughs> that there'll be ways to find um, to find those presences and those intersections too. Yeah. Thanks, Kira. That's one of the things that I've also said, that we need to, to look underneath and behind the words, um, particularly in, in my work around thinking about Torres Strait, writing Torres Strait histories. Um, so there's, there's a few more questions here. Um, so maybe Kate, if you, but mm. Kate, I've got this, this one, well, it's really for both of you. What advice would you have, do you have for beginning historians who are looking for topics that will help them develop their craft? <clears throat> yes, and their reputations. Um, two different things. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I do want to just put in a kind of, you know, voice of, I don't know, boring utilitarian pragma pragmatism here that... Um, that against the call for creativity in history and thousands of flowers blooming, we do have to uh, factor in a pretty strict publishing industry um, that has some issues of its own, to be honest. Um, and historians that I know anyway, either face an academic publishing industry or a tra what, what, what we call trade book publishing. Um, and I, you know, I've often heard the, the criticism that academic historians don't know how to write for trade and that's why they don't do it and that's why they're kind of and, and they don't know how to write mm. I really really mm. really push back against that uh, every historian that I've that I know is an excellent writer and thinks very very carefully about their craft um they often do not have topics which a trade publisher will take a gamble on um and topic anyway in Australian publishing is very very much a key part uh it, it is I would have to say the fact that I actually ha I had published, I suppose, is one one aspect. But the key aspect about why I got a contract to write Ben Long and Philip is because of the topic. The publisher just wanted a book on this, right? And how much I wanted to be creative, which was actually kind of pushing the the limits of of um, of some literary conventions here and there, was more of a challenge than an attraction to the publisher, right? Uh, I had to kind of like negotiate with the publisher to make it. And I totally understand where they're coming from because in trade publishing, there's no subsidy from a university. They have to make money. And the fact yeah. is that the market is not very creative. It is actually very conservative. When we talk about bestsellers in history, these are not the convention-breaking histories of, mm -hmm. um, of our time, right? Um, yeah. They are the ones yes. that not only conform to convention, but often conform to the message that mm. the reader wants to hear, i.e. the reader has not been challenged in their thesis mm -hmm. in the past, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yes, so if you want your reputation to be elevated, you might want to consider picking a very staid topic and writing in a very conventional manner. I mean, that, that <laughs> seems very kind of negative thing to have said. <laughs> You know, Which really goes against the the what um what Kira has just said to us. Well, well. I mean, it, it's it doesn't. It doesn't. Like <laughs> um, I I agree with with um a lot of what Kate's saying there, and and I think if we look at the Australian publishing industry right now, there are publishers who um are you know do take risks, but there is a lot of history that's written by journalists in a way where um research is done for them, and there's not much sort of sensitivity to those questions mm -hmm. about partiality and bias um in the re-rehearsal of themes and and um and arguments and ideas that are already um so well known that they're perhaps no longer interesting or um yeah they're less to be animated with the dynamism that really makes a work important and exciting um I you know I was given a few tips by Alan and Unwin and um <laughs> I don't know if they would stand by these tips anymore now but um you know to be frank they are interested in women's histories and so that might be a helpful thing to think about um and I don't know if it is or not I think that um things that family histories that can be richly told through um 
a saturation or, uh, you know, a, a situating in a context that is um, enlivening and distinctive. But I, I do sort of think that the way the story to is told is almost as important as the story itself. Um, but I would say before you worry about your reputation, do build your craft. And that takes a very long time. You know, what do they say? It takes 10,000 hours to build your craft. Um, and wow. every book is its own journey. You kind of start from scratch. You bring some things with you, but um, you've got to get yourself in the chair. You've got to get into those archives and sources and go from knowing them to being so deeply familiar with them that they're at your fingertips in your sleep, so to speak. So I, I think start with mm -hmm. diverse reading and following your nose. Um, but... Mm -hmm. You know, Carlyle, that horrible man, <laughs> well, maybe he's not all horrible. He once said, oh, all history is just the biography of great men. What an awful thing to say, but what a great thing to keep turning around and playing with. You know, why can't we make biographies of objects and women and, and uh, you know, relational biographies? Why can't we make those new forms of, of history? Mm. I will just quickly just Fantastic. add a little... Um... Addendum. So, yeah, I do think that building your reputation and building your craft is a bit different, obviously, other than the fact that I agree with Kira that you have to have had, you know, you have to be a decent craftsperson before you can build a reputation. Although that's actually completely, actually, to be totally strictly true, it's not always true of the best sellers. They're not always that well crafted, in my opinion. But anyway, mm. um, at the baseline, of course, also, you need to pick the topic that really you are personally passionate about because it's the only thing that will get you through the 10,000 yes. hours as Kira. Um, intimated yeah yes something you're passionate about and that will sell yeah mm, yeah um, two mm, things together yeah, two things together not always yeah. easier to tick well yeah. at the same yeah. time. not at all <laughs> but there's also not a question all. about what kind of reputation do you actually want you know I would be asking those kind of questions like what are the crafts that I want to acquire what crafts matter to me because some people are really interested in being stylistic writers some people are just interested in being straightforward kind of um clear and simple writers there's a place for all these voices so I think mm, yeah. to in commit to um an undertaking and that undertaking is shaped by the questions not the answers so to be asking yourself really rich questions about what is my voice what is my purpose here what what am I missing what, what can I do that is going to make a contribution and perhaps open people's minds and hearts just a little bit more? And then what is my reputation? What, what kind of reputation do I want? Wow. Yes. This is such a rich conversation. Thank you. I, we, I'm, I'm sure we can keep going. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes, though. And I, I can everyone else see the screen with the questions? And I wonder if you could, if either of you would pick one question to respond to, to wrap up. Um, I did see that question that's currently not on the screen about will history writing change post-referendum? Post mm, good, um, yeah. I would have wanted to say yes. I hope so. I'm not sure that it is going to be true because nothing seems to be um, changed in the non-Indigenous landscape post-referendum, it seems to me. So I... Yeah, maybe I won't pick that that question so much because <laughs> I'm getting a little bit down about that. I, I must say that I, I I wrote my book, Ben Long and Philip, assuming that it would come out long past a referendum. I thought the referendum would happen earlier, so it was interesting to see um, see the book come out come come out in the in the same week that we all had to go to mm. the polls. Mm. But um, you know, it, it was it was a similar it, it was the same old. It, it, it's the old conundrum that it came out and spoke to the choir that had already been converted really in some yeah. ways. But so I might just pick the um, the easier one, which was what are you going to write about next, um, which will probably be biographical. Uh, but I'm tossing up between two different projects. One returns me back to my 18th century kind of European training. Um, I found that uh, the, 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 spot, that the evidence, um, the intelligence that prompted the British government in the end to trigger the New South Wales to, to say, yes, we are going to go and settle New South Wales in 1785, um, 86, uh, was purchased from a spy mistress in Rotterdam. And I oh. became intrigued by the spy mistress. So I might think about just a singular, singular biography of her, which I've never written a singular biography. Um, but I am kind of reluctant 
as well, though, to give up the the richness of the Indigenous worlds that were opened up to me when I thought about Ben Long. So um, there's another kind of project that I've thought about writing kind of about Ben Long's counterpart type of negotiators um, mm. in, in his own world, but uh, slightly further afield into the Pacific mm. Rim as well. There are lots of contemporaries of Ben Long who were important negotiators and interestingly suffered a similar uh, fate uh, in their in later settler national histories of being kind of slightly written off. Mm. So I'm interested in that uh, Ben Long story as some kind of trope. So I haven't quite decided yet which which project will go down. Thanks, Kate. Well, we're eagerly awaiting. I think. Kira, uh, and on. Yeah. Look, I, I I'm not sure if I will write another book. Um, I, I I wrestle with this all the time. You know, writing this book has been a really painful, exhausting process. I've had two major knee surgeries. I've moved um, interstate twice. I've had five house moves. It's um. It's exacted a real toll, and it's interesting that um, I kind of feature Martha and Adelaide as the story of Persephone and Demeter. You know, Persephone goes into the underworld and Demeter um, turns the world to winter until her daughter is returned to her. And in some ways I feel like I was a little bit like Persephone going into the underworld and uh, I'm waiting for spring to come back. So I do have some big ideas of projects that um, have got me excited uh, but uh, you know one is the story my husband is um is Bunjalung um uh yeah Bidjigal heritage as well as Irish heritage and his um family history over several generations which involves his grandfather being a prisoner of war in Changi versus my family history where my grandfather um was got an OBE in the Victorian Cross in World War II for his serving in Dunkirk, et cetera, et cetera. There's just these really mm. interesting intersections between our family's lives that I think could be this kind of epic undertaking, um, but I might park it for like two decades and until the, both families are sort of ready for something like that. But I'd also love to do a new South Australian history. I think that the South Australian story is very often neglected in the national narrative. We don't sort of understand much about it. And having grown up in Victoria, spent a long time in Sydney, uh, I'm quite eager to bring the particularities of South Australian exceptionalism and the settler colonial story um, into, weave that into our national narrative too fantastic thank you thank you both um that's they are massive projects um <laughs> but as i said we'll we will wait and see we might just stop oh great thank you for, for for that so thank you everyone i think we've got we've actually gone past time um but and i and i is there anything else i need to do i don't think so i would just want to can we please thank our our guest um, our guest authors today, um, and if we were all together, we could have gone and had a drink and continued our conversation. I know, but unfortunately, things are as they are. But thank you, everyone, who was able to come today, and we look forward to spending more time with you, uh, History House New South Wales, next year, talking about the crafts, uh, the craftsmanship, the craftswomanship. Of, of writing and thinking about history. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Leah, for wonderful sharing. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks for tuning in. The History Council of New South Wales extends sincere thanks to Dr. Leah louis Cheviche, Dr. Kira Lindsay and Professor Kate Fullagar for their time and expertise. Thanks to the many people who attended and for your questions and to the many more who have just tuned in now. The History Council is supported by funding from Create New South Wales and by our members. Find out more about becoming a member of the History Council of New South Wales on our website, historycouncilnsw.org.au. We also thank our cultural partners, City of Sydney, Macquarie University, Museums of History New South Wales, National Archives of Australia, Placemaking New South Wales, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the State Library of New South Wales, University of New England, University of Newcastle, University of New South Wales, and the University of Technology, Sydney, Australian Centre for Public History. Thanks again. 